Treasuries here. Uh, big bid in Treasuries overnight on those Israel-Iran headlines. That is mostly unwound, around 4.6%, 6.2% on the 10-year yield. Really flattish on a, on a week-to-day basis, a little bit off of those multi-month high semiconductors. Really the drag on the NASDAQ today. Uh, super micro uh, getting taken apart. You also have uh, NVIDIA down 9% and, uh, and cracking well below its 50-day average AMD also on uh, on the downside. Netflix, after reporting a pretty strong quarter, uh, but uh, deciding to maybe not give as much information out about subs, stock down 9%. Maybe it's uh, giving some investors some hesitation about response to big tech earnings next week. That does take us to our talk of the tape. Has the market's 5% pullback over three weeks been enough to price in a more patient Fed, higher bond yields, and to reset expectations into the thick of earnings season. Let's bring in Lori Calvacina of RBC Capital Markets, Victoria Fernandez of Crossmark Global Investments, and Kevin Dreyer of Gabelli Funds. All join me here at Post 9. Great to see you guys. Lori, um, market, so look, we could go through March, and many of us did, and you did, and said, it's not going to be this easy forever. We had no 2% pullbacks, uh, so we were kind of due for some kind of a setback. Uh, but what specifically do you think the market's contending with? Obviously, we got the geopolitical headlines, the higher for longer story, and then, you know, maybe just a question about whether this economy can handle what yields are giving it. Yeah, I think it's it's a really strange time in the market right now. We've been overdue for this pullback. Sentiment has been stretched. I mean, I've been worried since January. We're finally getting the pullback now. Um, I think you've got a combination of de-risking to some extent. I think you've also got the begrudging acceptance of a hot economy continuing to build. And that's what I'm really seeing in the rotation today. We're seeing secular growth themes getting sold pretty hard. You don't need secular growth as much when cyclical growth is picking up. And, you know, I think I saw today the consensus GDP forecast is up to 2.4 percent. That's pretty darn close to average. For the full year? For the full year. Yeah. And in a hot economy, you typically see value and small cap and cyclicals outperform. It's the cool economy that growth and secular growth themes tend to dominate. We're on the cusp of exiting that. We do have things like banks up today, energy up today. So part of that cyclical value trade, perhaps. Um, I guess the question is, if earnings are going to hang in there in general, um, you know, do we need any further setback than we've had already? So to me, a garden variety pullback is 5 to 10 percent. That drawdown that we had last fall when interest rates were spiking was about 10 percent on mm -hmm. the nose. So there could be a little bit more to go. We've got to watch the sentiment indicators pretty closely, and they've been pretty frothy. So I think it's going to take a little bit of work to really get them down. I don't think you have to turn to an Uber bear here as long as we've got the economic tailwinds at our back. The, the reality is if you see a pullback more than 10 percent in kind of the 15 to 20 percent range, that's typically associated with a growth scare. And I don't think we're talking about that right now. So even if it gets a little bit worse, I wouldn't really expect it to go too far below, say, 4,700 or so. Victoria, um, your take on, you know, whether in fact uh, the market is telling you either to be more defensive or uh, if it says, look, you know, let's get used to an economy that's just running at a higher metabolism. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of both built in there. Um, as Lori mentioned, pulling back to kind of that 47, 4,800 level gives us that 10 percent correction. It's that 200 day moving average for the S&P. So it makes sense that would kind of be the place to go in and start adding. But you look at some of the things we're seeing, you've only got less than 30 percent of the the S&P trading above its 50-day moving average, right? Put call ratio moving higher. You look at the flows, the volume of flows into short S&P ETFs, that's increasing. So I feel there is very much a defensive uh, mood around the markets. And so put some defensive into your portfolio. Some of those areas are doing better. Utilities, which typically don't do well in a rising rate environment, but we're seeing it now. Um, names like telecom, low beta, Good cash flow companies, I think, is where you need to park some money right now. Because we do think, as you know, we've been talking all year, we do think we're going to see probably a, probably another 4 to 5% pullback here. Oh, those things that you do mention, though, money flowing into short funds and people hedging more and, and essentially showing some concern, are also the makings of a bounce, right? They I mean, that's are. what you have to watch for. They are, and, and you typically have kind of three different elements, right? When you have a, a complete turnaround here, you have the initial pullback, then you have a bounce, and then the third leg of that stool is you go back lower. So maybe we're getting a little bit of a bounce here. I think you watch discretionary versus staples. Yeah. Watch that ratio, see how that's going to do. It's consolidating right now. If we see that start to pick up, then maybe that tells you you're in that second phase of the bounce. Thank you.
Kevin, as you look uh, at companies and, and how they're valued right now and, and their prospects, uh, do you feel like you're getting more opportunities? Do you feel like the companies are telling you that the outlook is getting better? Or, or how are you navigating it as, you know, S&P's down 5%, the majority of stocks down a lot more? Right. I think it depends a lot company by company, which is how we operate. We're very bottom up. Uh, but to some of the questions from earlier, you know, the market's been grappling with this what are rates going to do, which relates to what's inflation going to do. And what was it a few months ago? I think consensus what was we'd have seven rate cuts this year. And <laughs> we're down to, I don't know if it's two now or yeah. if we're at zero already. But, two maybe. but yeah. you, you know, I think, the, I, you know, I'm not sure we're expecting much in the way of rate cuts this year. So probably a higher for longer yeah. kind of environment, which makes things like pricing power really, really important. Uh, we tend to gravitate towards those more stable cash flow generating companies, whether they're consumer branded names, a waste collection name. Um, we've got some you know, names you might call defensive in there, but also a lot of cyclical type names in the industrial area that are benefiting from a lot of the underlying trends that are going on. On the, on the whole Fed equation and how that storyline's gotten scrambled up, I did want to uh, pick up on something Rick Reeder of BlackRock told us about you know, the Fed's approach right now and how we might have to uh, contend with it. I still think the Fed would like to get one or two cuts done this year, but we need the data to help us. So I think in the interim, you got to let the market do what it's going to do. Got to get the data to help us. So that would obviously mean inflation has to ease back a little bit. Market's going to do what it has been doing, which is kind of struggle to figure out exactly what the path is, Lori. How instrumental is it in terms of whether we get uh, the cuts? And I guess because if we don't get it, it probably means inflation is running higher than they want. Yeah, and I think it's also why is inflation running higher? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a recognition that the geopolitics are somewhat out of control at this point in time, right? Um, I do think that if the economic backdrop is pretty strong, what I've been hearing from most investors I've talked to over the last week or so, if the Fed stays pat, doesn't do anything, the economy's fine, labor market's not breaking down, there's nothing really wrong with that if we're trying to keep the inflation genie in the bottle. So I feel like the market has to reprice in that scenario, but not necessarily tank. Mm -hmm. um, our modeling is suggesting that 4900 is kind of of a fair value when we do all our modeling with interest rates, inflation assumptions, and PEs. Um, and so we're not too far off from that right now. That's without cuts, in other words? That's without yeah. cuts. No further move from the Fed. We really damage the market in our modeling if we bake in additional hikes, mm -hmm. um, which we take inflation above to about 3.5%. We take Fed funds up to 6 We take 10-year yields up to 5 5 When we do that math, we can come up with a 4,500 number on the S&P. Yeah. Uh, and Victoria, I guess, you know, one of the reasons the market gets nervous, because, yeah, that scenario where the economy's fine, inflation is OK, but not getting better and the Fed just sits around is OK. But it in inherently creates this sense out there that risks are rising of a hard landing. That's something the longer we wait can go wrong. And, and so I guess, is there a yield level you're watching? Is there uh, some other indicator that you would say, are we at risk of something in that scenario? Well, I know, you know, you look back and that 5% on the 10-year Treasury really triggered a lot of uh, emotion yeah. when we saw that not too long ago. A lot of that, though, was due, due to the increased issuance scare that everyone had and that the refunding announcement and what we were going to see. I don't think we'll get that same information May 1st when we get the next refunding announcement. The Treasury General account is bigger than it was then, so there'll be a little more liquidity there to deal with. Um, but I think you have to watch that. The longer that the rates stay higher, we know we have those lagged effects that come through, and it just continues to build, and inflation becomes more embedded. So you have to watch how that's going to then affect corporate margins, wages, all of that, because then I don't think you get earnings giving the economy what it needs in order to keep the valuations where they are. And I mean, what's happening with the bond market is is real yields are rising, right? So real exactly. yields are going up that sometimes acts as a restraint either on maybe valuation, maybe on the economy. But does it also make it attractive as a buyer of bonds at these levels? Well, and you're talking to a bond manager, yeah. right, that likes these yields that we're seeing, especially when you look kind of in a barbell situation and lock in some on the long end, take advantage on the short end. But when those real yields get close to 2%, we're at a, what, a 194 right now, that's when you start feeling a lot of squeezing going on in the equity markets. And we're getting really close to that level. Last time we saw them in 23, like in November and in March, and then you had to go all the way back to 07 to see that prior to. So definitely watch real yields. That's where I think the pressure is really coming in. Kevin, um, as you look at the way companies are able to navigate this environment, you see, you know, when yields have gone up, 
uh, all of a sudden the market can't broaden out anymore and smaller stocks get hit a little bit more and, and it becomes a kind of a safety trade or has been at least into big growth defensives and things like that. Um, the kinds of companies you look at, I mean, are you, are you kind of uh, aware of the sensitivity to it and how are they getting through it? Yeah, I mean, there's always sensitivity. Uh, I still think when I look at the market, small to mid caps is probably where I'm overall seeing the most value. I mean, yeah. not exclusively, but companies can navigate it a lot of different ways. One is just their own business performance. And those companies, again, with pricing power tend to be able to navigate this kind of situation better. But also companies who engage in financial engineering. We've seen a lot of that over the last few years. I mean, one example, Kellogg spun off its cereal business. They call it WK Kellogg last year. It's a tiny stock. Nobody wanted it. Cereal's not growing. Um, it's up over 60% this mm -hmm. year now. So that's just one example where uh, value can be surfaced. So we'd hunt around and say, who else could do that? You've got a Campbell Soup who bought Sovos just last month. Uh, they own Rayo's pasta sure. sauce. Uh, you probably go to the restaurant. I can't get it to you. <laughs> but, I've been uh, once. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's a new growth engine for them. They've got a snack business and then a meals business. Right. Maybe they'll do a similar thing that Kellogg did with Kellanova and WKK. I mean, we've so, seen what GE's done. I mean, G obviously, carving GE itself up. Century was just yeah. IPO'd out of Southwest Gas. I mean, right. we've seen a lot of this. And, um, you know, it's not every time, but that can be very value surfacing. And often, one or both of the pieces might be attractive to acquirers, too. Sure. So, Laurie, in terms of net net, in terms of beyond the index level um, modeling of, of what fair value is, what still makes sense at this point? I mean, are, are you kind of, okay, this is the mid-cycle playbook kind of thing in terms of sectors and whatnot? I think we're still in the middle of a strange recovery trade. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we've are we're cooled off on small caps a little bit. I mean, I, I thought uh, that discussion was really interesting on the individual names because I hear about that a lot from my small cap PM clients. Um, small caps have really not benefited from the recovery, I think, that we had off recession-like conditions in 2022, really the problem has been we need more certainty over Fed rate cuts. Mm -hmm. um, but there is still a tremendous amount of value there. Um, I think sectors like energy and financials, which benefit from the rotation, um, they're still very cheap. We've got to watch the valuations there. Earnings revision trends are starting to improve. I think you just stay focused on things like earnings momentum, valuations, and stop worrying so much about exactly where we are in the cycle, because I think this is a strange one. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. It hasn't followed a lot of uh, the easy rules. And I guess something like uh, banks, Victoria, I mean, you know, you could talk about where we are cyclically. You had a lot of, uh, you know, OK numbers coming through, but it seems like an abandoned group. So the, the action today seems to be whatever's crowded, which is mega cap and expensive growth, right. is getting sold in favor of stuff that was under owned. Yeah, I mean, people are looking for that opportunity to go into something that has pulled back pretty significantly, but where you have some opportunity to see the growth and look low momentum is outperforming high momentum right now and this, over what period like since just, March yeah, or so yeah. yeah just recently and but you look and momentum has actually been tied very closely with quality and it's the names like you're talking about right you look at those names that have good earnings growth um, good cash flow so you have to kind of separate those out a little bit now find some areas that haven't had that high momentum that you can go in where valuations have come down and then make sure that the the balance sheet makes sense to go along with it and that can be across sectors right you can do it in finance you can do it in healthcare. you can do it in energy um, telecoms we talked about earlier and utilities, I think you can find some places in the market. Yeah, if you're not sector neutral about it, then if you go right. momentum, quality, growth, everything comes up tech That's or, right. you know, communication services, yeah. right? So it's it's a little bit tough to, to know what you're getting. You know, uh, Kevin, the other piece of it, when you talk about financial engineering, the M&A story hasn't really been that active, I guess, uh, with small and mid caps either. I mean, you'd expect you had the makings of, you know, private equity doing more and things like that. Yeah, it was, uh, M&A was actually up in the first quarter yeah. for the first time in a while. I mean, it's been kind of steadily decreasing the last last couple of years. So I think we're seeing some bright spots there on the M&A front. Um, before, it was a lot of mega deals. We've seen a lot of biotech deals mm -hmm. uh, recently. But I think we are seeing more deal making in the industrial area. We've got Command, which was a long time holding of ours, which is in the process of being bought out. That whole uh, vendors uh, to... Uh, the aerospace and defense industry, you know, is one that private equity and strategics have looked at uh, quite a bit. Yeah. And um, and Lori, I mean, the one thing that isn't flagging right now is is credit conditions. So you can talk about, um, you know, yields are going up, stocks down, dollar up, volatility up. Those are all tightening financial conditions on one level or another. But the credit piece of it is is sort of hanging in there. 
No, it is. It's really remarkable. And I think that's a testament to all the repair that's been done since the last crisis. I think one of the things that's very, very different about this post-COVID era and also, you know, causing some confusion, frankly, about how to navigate this environment. Yeah, no doubt about it. Great uh, discussion. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Have a good Thank weekend. You. All right. Uh, we are keeping an eye on Netflix tumbling after week of that expected revenue guidance and announcing plans to stop reporting subscriber numbers. CNBC.com's Alex Sherman joins us now uh, with what all this means and how the street's taking it, Alex. Look, I think uh, from a narrative standpoint, uh, Netflix's decision to stop reporting uh, quarterly subscriber numbers in the first quarter of 2025 is the most interesting because it really marks the end of an era, right? It marks the end of the streaming wars as we know it. I mean, shorthand, the first metric that investors and consumers alike would talk about in terms of comparing streaming services was, well, how many subscribers do they have? And Netflix has always been by far the dominant player in this world with, you know, 270 million plus subscribers. The fact that they're not going to announce this anymore, at least from a quarter to quarter basis, uh, is a suggestion that A, maybe subscriber growth is going to start slowing in 2025. But B, they want the street to start valuing the company on other metrics like revenue and profit and free cash flow. Uh, you know, these aren't maybe as handy as number of subscribers, but they are what other businesses uh, are, in fact, uh, you know, judged by. And, and they do provide a more specific, accurate assessment of the business. For sure. Um, I always feel like, you know, sometimes when companies do this, I mean, of course, Netflix and Disney at some point stopped giving guidance on sub growth, I guess, not that long ago. Uh, I can think of other industries where they basically said not just we want investors to focus on something else, but internally within the company, they want to make sure that, you know, everyone is playing toward the, the proper benchmark in a way and, and don't get too caught up in the short term. On the other hand, you did allude to the fact that maybe it means, you know, sub growth is, is decelerating or maybe the benefits of the, the password sharing crackdown. Maybe they've seen, uh, you know, the extent of it. Uh, I guess I'm trying to find other explanations for, you know, this stock getting knocked down 9 percent, except for the fact that it's a tough tech market. Yeah, look, you, you alluded to the fact that there was a weaker revenue guidance, particularly in the second half, a little bit of revenue growth deceleration coming that maybe analysts weren't expecting. And that's one reason I think the stock is down. But I, yeah, look, I think to your point, uh, we've seen a nice uh, rebound of Netflix since 2022, when really the floor fell out in the stock. And that's when subscriber growth plateaued after soaring during COVID. So this idea now that they're not going to report subscriber uh, ads every quarter mm -hmm. is at least a suggestion that this sort of unexpected rebound, which was really driven by the password sharing crackdown globally, you know, may finally be coming to an end. And it's been a great story for Netflix. And it has, in fact, coincided, led, whatever the word you want to use, to a nice rebound. So look, the evidence there is that investors are, in fact, trading off subscriber ads. It is an important yeah. metric still. So that, I do think, is a reasonable reason why the stock may take a dip now. Now, look, if Netflix keeps pouring out great revenue and free cash flow and profit numbers in 2025 and beyond, investors will probably move to that metric and be fine with it. If the business sure. is healthy, the business is healthy no matter what metric you use. No, there's no doubt about that, although it's interesting. As the stock has rebounded so strongly and got not too far from its former all-time highs, and, of course, the valuation gets a little bit elevated, a lot of the sell side in trying to defend the bull case would say, well, what you really care about here is what percentage of global broadband subscribers Netflix penetrates, right? I mean, it's like it's like 40 percent now globally. It's like 75 percent in the U.S., I think, if you include, you know, multiple users in a household or something like that. In other words, they everybody was sort of fixated on this one goal of getting that number up. And so I guess it just means you don't quite have the ability to track it in a, in a fine tuned way. Look, this company has gone through a series of waves of, you know, what is the right goal to reach here? There was a time where analysts were throwing out a, a potential TAM, total addressable market, of 800 million global subscribers for Netflix. Yeah. I mean, we're, that those days are way over now. I mean, no, no one even talks about 500 million as a realistic goal right. anymore. But on the other side... It, Netflix has 75 million U.S. and Canada household subscribers. The whole traditional cable bundle only has about 70 million. So that's a real win for Netflix. That's a success story. For sure. 
Um, well, I remember a time uh, when uh, postage rates were a huge mover of Netflix stock because they were throwing uh, they were throwing DVDs in the mail all the time. So this has this is a company we should remember that has managed to uh, to navigate uh, multiple different kind of cycles and innovation uh, you know waves. Yeah, exactly. The DVD days are over. The streaming days are here, and there will probably be a next wave, and Netflix will likely have to iterate one more time. We're seeing it already with live sports, maybe, as the next thing that Netflix gets in. The NBA rights are up fairly soon. We'll see if Netflix plays there. They inked a deal for WWE, so it is quite possible that in the next two, three years or so, Netflix gets into live sports, which is something that they really have not done in their history. Yeah, um, they've not done that in their history. It's, it's interesting because they've kind of broken a couple of rules <laughs> along the way in terms of things they said they might not do, of course, advertising being one of them. But we'll see uh, how it goes from here. Uh, Alex, appreciate it. Uh, talk to you soon. Thanks, Mike. Uh, a quick note Hello. to viewers. Welcome to Blue Cloud you Trading. It is Friday, April 19th. It's after the close. Another down day and up day for a couple of the indices, as you'll see in a moment. That was Closing Bell with some of the highlights from today and the guests there sharing their thoughts on the markets. Uh, we're now going to take a deeper look into the technicals. And what we are going to use is uh, the Ichimoku indicator. And uh, it's a Japanese indicator. And it will help us to assess what's going on in the markets at a glance, essentially. All right. I mean, you can see it very clearly what's happening. Price for example, on the Dow has dropped under the Ichimoku cloud and it's been staying under this section here, the, the Senku Span B for approximately six days now. Now we did have an up day, it was up 0.52% and uh, let's take a look at all the uh, all the indices for, for a moment. So the Dow up 0.56% today, NASDAQ was down 2.05. That's a big drop for the NASDAQ. Not surprising. S&P 500 down 0.88 and the Russell 2000 was up just barely at 0.16% above yesterday's close. And on the heat map, the semiconductors, oh my goodness, right? Look at this, folks. NVIDIA down 10.01% today. We're going to go into those charts in a few moments so you can see a little bit more. You know, you see Broadcom. AMD, QCOM, all down. Amazon was down 2.56%. You know, a lot of the, some of the software companies were down. Some, you know, and uh, communication services like Meta, Google, Apple, Microsoft. The sectors that did pretty well today were the banks. The utilities. Energy stocks did really well. Healthcare did pretty good, except for Eli Lilly. And um, consumer defensives. So let's take a quick look now. Let's start again with the Dow. We are looking at a daily chart. And, you know, one of the, um, this is a indicator that for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's Japanese. It has been around since the late 60s as far as being published, but it was developed in the late 1930s by a Japanese financial journalist who was trying to figure out a way to identify trends, support levels, resistance levels in the markets, momentum, and uh, created this really interesting and unique indicator that not only tells us what's going on right here in the, in the present, but also projects a bit into the future. When the Senku Span A drops under and closes under the Senku Span B as it did right here, that's usually a uh, indicator that we may have a down trend that's emerging and it has emerged um, price has closed through some very important levels as you can see here some of these levels like 384.92 based on that pivot candle it dropped under this candle here as well that's an important one back from february 13th of 2024 and uh, notice where it's finding support i mean i'm sorry resistance now because remember when price closes underneath a support level a prior you know low okay it tends to then find that as a resistance level on the way back up. And it's hard for the buyers to push through that level because that's the defense line for the bears. Okay. They're shorting or they're basically exiting the, you know, their positions uh, at these levels. And so 
it's even though we did have an update today, it was up 0.52%. It's very, you know, important to note that it never did break above that level. So next week, we may have a continuation. Now, here's another interesting thing. When I switch it to the weekly chart, um, let me do this. Let me take off the lines for a moment. And you can see now, this is the third week now that we are under the Tenkinson, the green line. So that green line represents the last nine periods, the highs and lows of the last nine periods divided by two. That's a very significant level. And, uh, you know, when price is above it, it tends to continue to, to stay in that trend. But when it does get under, you know, you really don't want to particularly on a weekly chart uh, be long. As far as I'm concerned, that's my position uh, on the Ichimoku. And I mean, that's the rule of the Ichimoku indicator itself. So, you know, you want to be long when price is above the moving averages and price is above the cloud. Now, if you are a long-term investor, the weekly um, time frame is probably the time frame that you want to be paying the most attention to. If you're a more active trader, swing trader, someone that likes to be entering more on a day-by-day -day basis, determining where whether you should be in the market, then you want to switch it to the daily chart. And the daily chart has been telling us now since this candle dropped underneath the both the Tenkinson and Kijinson, um, that was on April 2nd, that we really should not be in uh, a long position right now in the Dow. Notice how the Ichimoku very was very good at holding above these levels, you know, throughout this whole run. It dropped a few times under the Tenkinson, found support at the Kijinson, which is now the Kijinson is the red line. That's the highs and lows of the last 26 periods divided by two. So it's the slower moving average. So found support here and here, these few levels here. And then once it got underneath, it just continued to drop. Another important thing, or part of the, one of the other elements of the indicator tells us that we want the Tenkins and the green line to be above the red line. And uh, as you can see here, it did cross underneath. So this is even more bearish at this point. So we could have a more extended drop, uh, but we could also just as easily, if you know positive news comes out with the earnings, you know, this at the end of this month and uh, into next month we may see a uh, bounce back all right the earnings announcements are really going to help to decipher where this market's going to go okay so let's look at the uh, at another index the russell 2000 this one also has been down it we were up 0.16 percent today uh, but since uh again april 2nd it really wasn't an, you really probably shouldn't have been in this uh, specific ETF. How about Q's, the QQQ ETF? This one also has dropped under, now it's dropped under the cloud, very bearish. It's uh, down, it was down 2.07% today. It broke through some levels that I had drawn right there, the 432.74 based on that pivot candle there. So that prior low, and then once it broke through there, you know, and then the very next day, this was on April 16th, price actually um, found resistance at that level. So that was a bad sign right there. The next day it opened right at that level and closed below and then it's continued, right? It's now also broken through some additional levels. It broke through this level over here, right? That low and this low. So that is a problem. So yeah, I mean, but we've had multiple days now where price has been, you know, uh, dropping. And next week, if some positive news come, we may get some bullish behavior. It wouldn't be an entry point, in my opinion. You know, again, you should only be considering long positions as far as the Ichimoku goes uh, when price is above those moving averages and the cloud. All right, let's take a look at the SPY. SPY has dropped also since... Uh, well, it dropped under the Tenkinson here back on April 2nd. So notice how all indices pretty much, you know, were in confluence. They were all dropping under the Tenkinson on that specific day. They stayed underneath. Well, the SPY did. As you can see here, it was it got barely above it right there, but continued to drop. So it's it's had that drop. It's It was down 0.87%. It's going to probably find some support here, hopefully, 
at the bottom of the cloud. That's the last level of resort for the Ichimoku indicator. Once price gets underneath, that's very bearish territory. If you look down below, the directional movement index is um, moving up the ADX, and that shows that momentum is to the downside, and you can see all the negative volume bars down below here too. So this is, there's a lot of um, people just kind of taking profits at this point. You know, they've had a long run. They've been waiting to see when this thing is going to drop down, you know, basically uh, pull back. And this is it. This is the pullback. The question is, where will it stop? And that's the thing we can't predict. Uh, but we can certainly stay out of a downtrending market, okay, when the Ichimoku is giving us all the clues that we should be out of it. All right, let's uh, take a look at the sectors. And then we'll take a look at some of our subscribers' requests. Silver, let me actually hold on, let me go to the top here. Let's start with the VIX. Okay, so the VIX is the market volatility index. And, uh, you know, I've talked about this a little bit, mentioned how we had broken above it the Ichimoku cloud right here. That's a bad sign for the market. We don't want volatility in the markets. We don't, this is a fear index, the VIX. When this increases, okay, the market tends to drop. So it popped up, you know, on this date. This was on uh, April 4th, okay? Uh, that's the day. Uh, and, and so here's April 2nd. We started, we have broken above the Keijins, and that was a bad sign right there. That led to the market kind of dropping, remember, under the Tenkinson. And so now we've had this big, you know, it's gone up 46%, you know, the fear in the markets. Uh, so... We did get to a new high, but then towards the end of the day, you can see the VIX dropped a bit down to 18.7. It was as high as 21.3. All right, utilities, XLU. Now, the utilities, let me, let's take a look at the weekly first on this one. XLU came up basically to this level of 66.70 and then retracted. And uh, it's now broken above the Ichimoku cloud. Was very bullish today, the, the ETF. Uh, it's, it's been showing some strength for the last three weeks. Uh, the second it, it popped above the Ichimoku cloud, it's above the moving averages. The only thing it hasn't accomplished yet is breaking above this high. And that's a reversal candle, it's a pivot candle, and or a what they call a shooting star. I'll just show you very quickly what that looks like. It's after a move up when you have a long wick and a small body. That's called a shooting star. That's a negative candle. And that caused this little drop here that you see. Um, it's it's also going to act at the top of that. The high of that level is going to act as a level of resistance. Okay. The sellers will be waiting right around this area. That's why it's probably a good idea to wait for uh, price to close above this level, 66.70. We, on the daily chart, we do uh, have more bullish candles here. But again, the 6670 level is approximately just 1.9% away. So you'd be risking quite a bit of money to make 1.9%. doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, right? XLF, financials. Let's look at this one on the weekly. Last three weeks has been dropping. It's still under. So this is the, the second week where it's under the Tankinson. That's very bearish, so you, I would not be uh, looking to enter, even though the, the banks did pretty good today, uh, creating this um, this hammer candle. Uh, it is a red hammer, and I wouldn't be entering a long position quite yet. I'd want to wait until Friday of next week. I would like to confirm that price is closed above the Tenkinson, and then I'll I'll consider you know uh, long any long positions in the in this sector. On the daily chart, you can see we're still under the Tenkinson and Kijinson. Tenkinson is crossed under. It's all negative, but we did pop above the, the cloud. So we have a lot of mixed uh, signals here, and that's not a good reason to be entering a long position. Silver. Silver's been in a range here for a little bit now, between 25.25 and 26.43. Um, actually, I'm sorry, up to 27.39. But uh, it looks like it's finding resistance at Tenkinson. So on the daily chart, even though it was up 1.31%, that's not a buy for me. Plus, it has some resistance up above. 
energy has closed above the Kijinsen, but is still under the Tenkinsen. I would be holding off until we get a close above this level. Let's take a look at the weekly, though. So, yeah, the weekly... Um, so let me show you this really interesting uh, level, 94.71. All right, let's go back in time a little bit. See that candle that I'm pointing right to right here? That's a doji, a negative candle, a pivot candle. And uh, generally, let's show, let me show you that one too. It's called a bearish spinning top, where the wick on the top is equal to the wick on the bottom, and then you have a small little body, red body in the middle. That's what we had right there. And then price dropped, right? Now when that, so that makes this a very important candle. This is the level that needs to be broken for this sector to continue its its move up. That level found resistance, you know, price found resistance here uh, on September 15th of 2023, dropped, came up, and then three weeks ago, broke above that level. That was very significant. I talked about that. Um, and I, you know, as long, I basically said, as long as price on this ETF stays above 94.71, I'm bullish on the weekly. On the daily chart, uh, we've had this little pullback this last week, right? So, but it's, it looks like it's setting up for a buy very soon. If price gets above the Tenkinson, the Tenkinson right now is about uh, $96.21. If we get close above that level next week, on the daily charts, that would be a very uh, bullish, um, you know, potential strategy there to enter a long position. BITO, now where would you want to place a stop in a situation like that? If you're trading on the daily charts, you probably want to put it under the low of this candle, this reversal candle here, this uh, doji, okay? BITO is the ETF for Bitcoin, one of the ETFs. There are a lot of ETFs now for Bitcoin. This one, uh, on the let's look at the weekly first okay so on the weekly level we can see we are still staying above 27.44 but a, something negative that happened here price closed this friday under tankinson it did create a bullish candle a hammer uh even though it's red so you know after a move down let me just pop it up here there it is the hammer after a move down you have a long wick and a small green body or red body it could be a red body too um and and you know it could lead to a bullish move up not always but many times it does right it, because it really signifies what it's telling us is that the bulls took control after the end of that week towards the end of that week so yeah let's look at the daily chart on this yeah, so you can see here, this was the low here on Wednesday, and then on Thursday and Friday, you saw Bitcoin moving back up. But it's still under the Tenkinson, under the Kijinsen. I would stay out of Bitcoin for the time being. That's all I've got to say on that one. XLP, consumer staples on the daily is under the Kijinsen. And it's inside the cloud, not an entry, not a positive entry place to, to get in. On the weekly chart, consumer staples, XLP, is uh, under some levels of resistance here the 7489 plus we also haven't created a higher low yet notice how this low let me point to it right here all right is lower than that one we have not established a new like higher low yet so i would stay out of consumer staples there may be some stocks within this ETF that make sense. You can find those, for example, by hitting a component watch list in this right next to the ETF here, and it will pop up all the different stocks, right? And you can kind of scroll through these and check them out and see if there's any interesting opportunities. Just I'm just kind of curious. Let's, let's, let me run through this first for a moment. Um, like this one, for example, on the weekly chart looks good. CHD, Church and Dwight. Let's look at the daily chart. Looks good. The Tenkinson is under the Kijinsen. It's just an example of, of uh, if you want to be involved in a specific sector, but the sector itself is, is weak and you want to be uh, invested in stronger stocks within the sector. All right. So XLP on the weekly chart is under the Tenkinsen. So you'd want to wait until 
if you're a long-term investor, especially, you want to wait until price closes above that. You'd have to wait until Friday of next week because these are weekly candles. ITA has dropped. This is the Dow Jones U.S. Aerospace and Defense Index Fund. This one closed under the Tankinson this week, but it is in an uptrend. I would wait until Friday of next week to see if it uh, can hopefully pop right back above. above. You know, these, Sometimes these are just short-lived little pullbacks. And on the daily chart, as you can see, it's, it's finding some support here, multiple days, one, two, three, four, five days where it's just bouncing off of the cloud. The cloud acts as a very strong level of support. You can see it over here, where once it got above it, came down, found support, and continued on. All right, so real estate, XLRE. Well, it looks like it's slowing down. That's good because it's been dropping so much, but uh, we're under the cloud, we're under the moving averages. That's a, a no-go for me. Same thing here in the weekly chart, it's inside the cloud. Healthcare, this is the third week on the weekly chart under the Tenkinson. I'd wait for this one. I would not be entering a long position in XLV. On the daily chart, it's under the cloud, showing more bearishness. ADX moving up, that shows weakness too. Gold on the weekly chart. Let's start with the weekly. So we created a reversal candle here, a pivot candle. Let me just make a big circle here so you can see it. Uh, we made a, um, we developed this last, not this week, that's gone by, but the week before. And when you get a reversal candle like this, you really have to be cautious um, because the low of that candle which is, let's see, where is that? Let's find out. Let's put it in there. The low is 214.61. Let's put that in. Okay. Now we have a reference point. We now know that, okay, gold has had a nice long run, but it could potentially, if it closes uh, next Friday under this 214.61 level, you may want to exit your position and take your profits because... These reversal candles are very, they're very powerful. Again, what that's telling us is the psychology of what's happened between the buyers and the sellers. The buyers push the price, right? Buyers push the price all the way up to that level, top of that wick. And then the sellers, once they got up to this level, started pushing down and they push it down further, 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 more than the buyers were able to, right? Uh, and so that shows weakness right there. Now, price the next uh, the next week on Monday, it did gap up a little bit there and moved up. So it's kind of holding up. But this 214.61 level is a level to watch. I'd put that down, you know, in your notes. And uh, let's look at the daily. On the daily chart, you know, gold has been ultra strong. It's been holding up, right? This candle here is what caused it, all of this. So on the daily, you're still good. But, uh, you know, just watch out for that Tankinson. That, that price doesn't close underneath it. Right now, the, the um, price on the Tankinson here is 219.88. Bitcoin, this is the dollar amount now. So Bitcoin is still inside this range, the box that I had built here to show the range of the price of Bitcoin. Um, one of the things I don't like is the fact that you can see from this high here, to, to that high, right? Price has been sloping down. That's usually a bad sign. What that tells me is that the buyers were not even able to bring it up to that level, the prior level. And so there's a lot of weakness here in Bitcoin right now. And price got into the cloud. So this, this is not an opportune time to enter. Okay, let's look at the US dollar, UUP. That was one of our subscribers requests, so we're just gonna do it right now. Um, Let's look at the weekly first. So on the weekly chart, this is a gap that occurred back on December 15th of 2023. Okay, that week there. And when a gap occurs where price drops that significantly under a level, um, it typically, once price comes back, it tries to fill that gap. And that's what happened here. It filled the gap, right? Now, we 
are barely above that level. Not, not by much, but we also created a spinning top, a reversal candle here, and we're inside the cloud. So the US dollar, even though it was up, you know, basically since January now, it's been, it's been moving up steadily. Um, it's going to find some resistance uh, here at the top of the cloud. And so hopefully it does, because if the US dollar weakens, then the market will strengthen. All right. We'll see what happens, um, or it should. XLB. Oh, let me look at the daily real quick too. So on the daily chart, you can see it's kind of ranging now in this little range. Uh, I'll just make a little box for that one so we can keep an eye on that. Because yet generally when you see price just kind of stagnant like that, it is, uh, it's taking a breather. And if price closes, for example, under that above that level, then you can expect a continuation, you know, but if it does close under, it could pull back down to the Tengensen. All right, XLB is materials. Let's look at the weekly first. So it looks like it's just barely closed under the Tengensen. So that's a warning right there. Um, on the daily chart, it's been under the Tenkinson now since uh, this um, candle, right? April 10th. It actually happened first here on April 4th. It popped up above it temporarily and then just dropped again. So there's a lot of weakness. And uh, it was down 0.08%. I would stay out of materials, stocks for the time being. Industrials on the daily chart is uh, also under the, the two moving average that up here, the Tengensen and Kijensen, finding some support at the cloud. I would still stay out of industrial stocks temporarily. On the weekly chart, we broke under the Tengensen. So that's very bearish. How about copper? Uh, this is the weekly chart now. We created a doji, a pivot candle right here last week. And so it penetrated that level, but never closed under. So this is a perfect example of uh, where that's why we need a closing price under this low in order for this ETF to show we even more weakness. Right now, it's just ranging, and we'll see it here in the daily chart. There it is. So it's just kind of stuck in between these two levels. Um, I would I'd be holding off on copper because I don't like that. Uh, if maybe if um, once price can break above forty seven twenty two, that will show strength and it could continue. But look how far away we are. Whenever I see price getting this far, all right, we're talking about a big gap here between the Tenkinson and the Kijensen. I, I'm a lot less uh, likely to enter a position in a stock like that because remember that this is the equilibrium level. This is where price always comes back to, right? It's like a magnet. So uh, I'd stay out of copper until it comes back down to closer to the Tengensen levels. That will be a more optimal, cheaper place to enter. XHB, Home Builders. This is the weekly chart closed under the Tenkinson. All right, three weeks in a row where it's been dropping, we had a bearish pattern here, a bearish engulfing. It's when we have a small bullish candle and a large red candle that engulfs the prior candle. I'll show you that one too. So we look here in the candle pattern reference sheet under bearish. Instead of a single candle, we're looking at double candle patterns. And this is it. Let me zoom in on it. A bearish engulfing. Small white candle or green candle, larger red candle engulfing the smaller body. That's what we have here. Price got, once price closed under this low, all right, that was the first like, signal uh, on the weekly. It did find support at Tankinson, but now there's a continuation happening. Not good. On the daily chart, we are inside the cloud. We had the cross here of Tankinson under Kijinson. XLY um, on the weekly first. This is consumer discretionary. Um, so this one here is, uh, as you can see on the weekly chart, it's under the Tenkinson now for two weeks, three weeks probably, because you can see that tank, the price closed under there. Uh, it should find some support on the Kijinson soon, but again, I'd stay out of consumer discretionary for the time being. 
you want to wait for the weekly to conf to give us confirmation before entering a long position. On the daily chart, we're very weak. You can see it's just dropping. It broke through uh, another level of support, it looks like. Let me find out. Is that true? Let me get a more exact level. Hold on. We need to get specific down, right down to the penny. So the low of that candle is 169.72. This is a daily level. We'll color it light red so we can differentiate from the weekly. 169.72 is the level that I just drew. We are barely above it by four pennies. We're at 169.76. So what does that mean? It means like, well, if you're just happen to be holding on to it, like if I was holding on to XLY, for example, I would I'd be like, okay, well, I've had this big drop. Let me wait until Monday, and hopefully Monday, by the end of the day, price will close above 169.72. We'll get a bounce here. We've had these multi we've had six days in a row where price has been closing, you know, lower and lower. Maybe we'll get a bounce here potentially. We'll see. Um, but I wouldn't be entering any new long positions. All right. Okay. XLK technology. Let's look at the weekly first. Weekly broke down pretty pretty bad this week, right? It was a big drop. Also today, 2.06% for XLK. Another negative thing I'm noticing below here. This was the first week, guys, where the directional negative DI line, the red line, crossed above the positive DI line on the directional movement index indicator, signifying a potential new downtrend, potentially. The ADX is moving sideways so there's not a lot of momentum here but the volume was higher today than it was the prior day we'll see what happens all right technology stocks did not do good as we just saw all right um let's see us dollar we already did that one here are some of the requests from our subscribers the t-bill okay <laughs> this is really not something that you can like analyze obviously all right because it, it it's not something that you can actually analyze on the ichimoku indicator because it is uh, you're essentially buying u.s treasuries so i i'm not even going to go there with this there's nothing to, to see here syld um this is a etf cambria shareholder yields on the let's start with the weekly chart this one broke under the tankinson this week this is, you know, probably a good time to take some profits. We don't know how far down it's going to go. That's the, that's the problem. It was up 0.87% today, though. And it is finding some... Uh, it did create a bullish pattern. I'll show you what... That's the bullish engulfing pattern. So on this side here, under the double candle patterns, it did create this. A larger bullish candle engulfing a smaller red candle. That's good happened right here let me circle it so we've now essentially created on the daily chart a a pivot candle area here this is the the low what is the low there 6870 and this one's 6862 so we're going to take 6862 all right now we have a support level which coincides, ironically, with this high, which is interesting. Oh, interesting, and this high. So that may, that gives it more significance, right? I mean, look at that. That's so interesting. Right there, and right there. And it was finding resistance here, too. Okay, so we may get a bounce here on this ETF next week. I'd be watching this. But I wouldn't be entering a long position because the Tenkinson is under the Kijinson. All right. SCVE, Santa Clara Valley Bank. Let's see here. It's a $6 stock. Okay. So when you have something that has like zero volume, okay, as you can see down below here, I mean, this is a, it's not really something that you can actually um, analyze on a chart. So we're going to skip this one, okay? <laughs> JEPQ, JP Morgan NASDAQ Equity Premium Income ETF. Let's look at the weekly first. 
Okay, so we had a big drop. Today dropped 1.99% um, on high volume. The direction negative DI crossed above the positive DI. If you're if you're in this and you've made some money, not a bad time to consider taking profits on the daily chart. We would you would have had that um, signal taking place actually right here when it got under the Tenkinson and Kijinson. Now you'd say, well, should I have entered back in here? Where the tank where price got right back above and closed above the Tenkinson and Kijinson. And as you can see, the Tenkinson was actually under the Kijinson right there at the same level. So that's not a good spot to enter. And if if I looked down below, I would have noticed, for example, that the there was uh the Tenkinson and Kijinson were right about there, just you know, uh at the same level. So I would not have entered that position. So this would have been the proper end exit location. You could have saved yourself about 5.1%. All right. EA series trust FTWO. Let's look at the weekly chart. It's dropping. It is above the Tankinson and Kijinson. So it's a, this, this, this ETF or trust has only been around since um, September 1st of 2023 but these last few weeks has been dropping. Now, I'm going to I'm going to show you guys a new uh candle pattern that I just saw here. Let me just pop it up again. I don't really talk about this one that much, but it is a thing. All right, let's circle it actually. Here we go. It's called dark cloud cover. I love these names, you know. Very interesting. Okay, so this is the pattern here. It's when you have a bullish candle and then you have a bearish candle slightly above that one, almost like a cloud, dark cloud hovering above, right? The candle. And that's what we actually have. All right. So let me show you. And that's a negative. Okay. It's a bearish pattern. So where is that? Right here. Okay, see how they're both about the same size? And it did gap up a little bit. I'm sorry, it gapped down from this high to this uh, low. But it, this level here is higher than the low here. That's that's that pattern right there. So uh, how do you know when to exit when you see something like this? Well, I, what I generally do is I'll look at the low. And uh, the low of this candle here is 27.91. And this is a weekly level, so I'll just type it in here. So 27.91. We didn't close about uh, below that level. We're at 27.94. We're literally three pennies above it. So it's really up to your discretion to determine whether you want to exit. If you're long, I don't know if the person that's you know holding this position or not even not holding position the position, but thinking about it. But I would wait until Friday of next week because this is a weekly level a weekly can a candle you'd have to wait until friday of next week to see where the following candle closes all right that's why i always say wait until the next week of friday on these weekly charts right now personally i would still be holding it because it has not broken that 2791 level this pattern has not materialized yet it's it's just giving us a warning so all right, let's keep going. DCAC. Um, now this one, Daniel's Corporate Advisory. Let's see. A weekly chart is very bearish. I mean, I don't know why you'd consider this one. Let's look at the daily. Yeah, there's no volume. See the, see the volume down below here? 16,000. Ideally, you want to trade stocks with about a million shares traded per day. All right? So that you have a lot of liquidity. Because when you don't have that, um, there's something called slippage. You can lose a lot of money and it's hard to like also decipher what the hell's going on with this stock. I mean, there's not enough trading that's taking place, right? So I would stay out, stay out of DCAC. CALF, this is Pacer US Small Cap Cash Cows, 100 ETF. Okay, let's look at the weekly first. All right, the last couple of weeks has been under the Tankinson. As you know, probably should not be entering a long position at this point. You'd want to wait for price to close above the Tankinson in the weekly. 
And on the daily, same thing. We're under the cloud. We're in a negative situation here. We did create a bullish engulfing pattern. But um, so if price, for example, closed under the low, uh, it looks like the low 45.17, you definitely want to be out. Um, it also would coincide with this candle, this pivot candle. The low there is 45.16, right there. Put that in there. Okay, and it's finding support right now. So that's good. Um, Monday, because this is a daily time frame. All right, I'd wait for Monday. I'd, I'd like to see where price closes towards the end of the day, around 3.30 or so. You should have an answer of where this thing is going to go. And if it closes under 45, it looks like it's going to close under 45.16. I would be exiting that position because the next level of support, it kind of looks like this down, it comes down to the $40.28 level. These levels, I guess you could argue that these could be potential levels of support, uh, you know, around th this level here and maybe this level here, 42.20. But, um, yeah, I wouldn't be holding this. And you can see down below the directional movement index is negative. Next one, AVUV. This is the final one. By the way, guys, if you like the software, okay, very easy to access the software, you can get it. Go to my YouTube homepage, Blue Cloud Trading. On the front page, you'll see this link, tc2000.com slash download slash Blue Cloud Trading. There are three more links that include the Finviz Elite if you click on that. But if we click on this one, it will bring you to the TC2000 page. You enter your email address here. If you haven't used the software for in the last 12 months, if you haven't had service with them, you can get a $25 coupon towards your TC2000 service. And here's the pricing over here. $749, $2249, $4499 for the different platforms, different um, uh, types. And my recommendation would be either gold or platinum because the silver is really bare bones. It just shows you charts and watch lists. You can't create alerts. You can't look at fundamentals like earner, earnings, sales info. Um, you can't drill down through sectors and industries. So I would, that's my recommendation is the start with the gold and see if you like it. And then if you do down the line, you, there's more options with the platinum, as you can see down below here. All right, getting back to AVUV. Oh, and one other thing. If you guys are liking this video and want to see more videos like it, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button down below. Much appreciated. All right, so AVUV on the weekly chart, two day, two weeks in a row now under the Tankinson. Not a not an optimal time to get long. As you can see, the volume is increasing steadily down below here, right? That's also negative. And then let's see what, what it looks like here on the directional movement index. Where it was in a uptrend, the uptrend, the momentum is dropping. See the ADX is dropping, and it looks like we may get a cross soon. The negative DI line may cross above the positive DI line. It hasn't happened yet on the weekly. Let's look at the daily chart. It has happened on the daily. So, in fact, the ADX has been moving up on the daily. All right. We've had a cross of the Tengensen under Kijensen. So, yeah, I wouldn't be entering a long position in this one. All right. I think that's going to do it. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you have a great weekend. I'm sure I'll do one more video during the weekend. We'll see. Um, but thanks for watching, guys. Appreciate it. Talk to you later.